been talking about biblical prophecy, and uh, we've been looking at uh, the fact that half of the Bible contains biblical prophecy. Um, and my slides will be up in a moment. And uh, half of those, okay, another quarter of those have already been fulfilled. And so when it comes to biblical prophecy, 25% of it still remains to be fulfilled. And we've been looking at these, and we've talked about Jesus making a prediction about the church. He said, I will build my church. And when he said that, what he was saying is it did not already exist. It was something yet to be happen. And so we find that Jesus, who made that prediction in the book of Acts, it actually came to be. He started a community that he called the church. He also had predicted that if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and to receive you that where I am, there you may be also. The very first reference that Christ, the Messiah, would come back and take people out of the world and take them back into heaven. Always before that, it spoke of the Messiah coming and establishing a kingdom upon the earth. Along with the Apostle Paul, both in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, are references to the fact that there one day was going to be this thing that's called the rapture. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it's actually the word, the rapture is the word for, in Latin, the Latin Vulgate, for the word caught up, caught up. And he says this, Therefore the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call, call of God, and the dead in Christ will be caught up, will be raptured. And they're going to go into the clouds of the air to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall they ever be with the Lord. I think it's just a marvelous passage, but we find in that passage that there's going to be this thing called the rapture of the church. Once the church is raptured, people who are believers in Jesus Christ, they're going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and give an account of what they have done in their bodies while they were on earth, and he's going to reward them for what they have done, or there will be a loss of reward if you really haven't done anything for him. It's a time of reward in heaven. Now, Jesus told us that while that is going on in heaven, something terrible is going on on earth. A time of labor pain, he calls it, Matthew 24, 1 through 14. And in the middle of this terrible time, there's going to be an abomination of desolation set up. It's going to be a statue that's going to desecrate the temple, and there's going to be an antichrist who's going to claim himself to be God. And when that happens, he told us in the second part of Matthew, he says, get out of Dodge, because there's going to be a time such as never was or ever shall be. And he goes, that's going to go on for three and a half years. This whole period that Jesus calls the tribulation, and that last three and a half years, the great tribulation will end with the second coming of the Lord with his angels, and, and his angels, and, and with us, and he's going to return to the earth, and that's exactly where Matthew 24 led us, to tell us there are some lessons to be learned from all of this. Learn the lesson of the fig tree. The lesson of the fig tree is this. You can know the season of the return, but you cannot know the hour. It's going to be like in the days of Noah. They did not know the day nor the hour when the, man, when the, when the flood was going to come, and so it will be when the Son of Man comes and establishes kingdom on the earth. No one will know the exact day nor the exact hour. And that's what the third lesson was about. If you knew the hour the thief was going to be breaking into your house, you would have stayed on watch with your weapon to keep him out. But no one knows the hour the thief has picked, and the Son of Man will come like a thief in the night. The last lesson was you need to be a good steward. A steward is somebody who is a servant who is responsible for the master's goods, and you need to be prepared in that. Now, the next thing that we need to do, maybe you could turn these monitors down a little bit. They are really coming back at me, okay? Um, to set up the kingdom that will last for a thousand years. Now, that's where we're at as we pick up now at this point with the kingdom. The very next verse in Matthew chapter 25, verse 1, Jesus says this, at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like do you see the word, the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven? Throughout the Gospel of Matthew, he's referred to the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. It goes all the way back to Daniel chapter 2, 
where Daniel had prophesied in a prophecy, it says, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. The God of heaven. So sometimes it's called the kingdom of the God of heaven. Sometimes it's called the kingdom of God. Sometimes it's called the kingdom of heaven. But it is always the same kingdom that was to come. It's kind of like in the Old Testament, there was an Ark of the Covenant. It was a box, kind of about the size of our Lord's Supper table. And that box contained the Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod that budded in a pot of manna, and above it were angels that overarched it, and, and it was all out of gold. Sometimes it's called the Ark of the Covenant of God, and sometimes it's called the Ark of the Covenant. Sometimes it's called the Ark of God, and sometimes it's just called the Ark. So it is with the kingdom of the God of heaven. Sometimes it's a kingdom, sometimes the kingdom of God, sometimes the kingdom of heaven, sometimes it's the kingdom of the God of heaven. He says this coming kingdom that the Bible is just prophesied all over the place throughout the Old Testament. He says, Jesus as will be like. Now as soon as I say like, I'm talking about a simile. It's a simile. And he's going to give us three parables because parables are nothing more than an extended simile or extended metaphor. He's going to give us three parables, and each one is going to talk about a, a different aspect of what the kingdom of heaven will be like when it comes. Now, just to remind you from last week, when the Lord returns from heaven, we are returning with him, and he's going to set up a kingdom, and we are going to rule and reign with Jesus for a thousand years. Isn't that awesome? This is what it will be like. Actually, he's talking about the entrance of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, the entrance into the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins waiting for a groom. I don't know if you've ever been to a destination wedding. Anybody here ever been to a destination wedding? All right. I've been to several. One across the state of Michigan, one in upper, upper Michigan, one in Mexico in January. It was nice and warm. <laughs> Getting a picture? destination wedding. This is a destination wedding. Listen, there's 10 virgins, according to the ta text here. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and they went out to meet the bridegroom. The bridegroom has gone to a destination wedding and he's going to be returning with his bride. So the question is, who are these 10? Well, they are not the bride. They're not the bride. In fact, the text goes on and says they are the friends of the groomsmen, the bridegroom, the bridegroom. They're not the friends of the bride, but of the, the bridegroom. They're the groom's friends. And these ten virgins, okay, are waiting for the destination wedding to come back. Now, I did a destination wedding two years ago, come this January, in Cancun. And it was nice. Now, there were probably far more than I ever expected to go to the destination wedding. There were probably mm, maybe 50, 50 that went, about 50. Yeah, and it's very memorable, uh, you know, had a wonderful time at that, that event. And we had a small reception there for the people who were there. But then when they came back, they had a reception. And I mean, there were hundreds of people at the reception. A and uh, it was like, they, they showed the videos uh, of the wedding that was going on, and, uh, but the, it was already, the wedding had already taken place. The thing that bothered me most about those videos is the wind was blowing and my hair was standing straight up. <laughs> All right. So we're, we're at, at this destination wedding, but we came back to the reception. Now, in this story that Jesus is telling, the ten virgins are really the nation Israel. Their Messiah is in heaven being united to his bride, the church. I know that from Ephesians chapter 5. Husbands love your wives even as Christ loved the church. And the church is to be submissive to the Christ as a wife is to her husband. So husbands must love their wives. Wives must respect their husband. And, and, and in the middle of that whole passage, he says, I show you this profound mystery. You think I'm talking about husbands and wives, but I'm talking about the church. You see, when we became Christians, we became the bride of Christ. And so the marriage is taking place here in heaven as we are in heaven with the Lord. And 
These ten virgins is the nation Israel, and they're waiting for the groom. That's who they know. They know the groom because they're Israelites. And when he returns with his bride, he says, he finds that of the nation Israel, there's foolish and wise virgins. The foolish, he says here, five of them were foolish, and five of them were wise. And he goes on to tell us what's, why, why this is so. The foolish ones took their lamps, but they did not take any oil with them. So I just so happen to have a lamp. Because you always wonder, how did they do this? How did they take their lamps? Here is a lamp. Uh, Brother uh, Nelson Haynes got this for me. And uh, this little lamp, you put the oil, I got a wick, you put the oil in there, olive oil normally, and then you put the wick in there, and you light it. So putting this, taking this little lamp along with you, pretty convenient. You just stick it in your pocket, right? So I don't know if you've ever been anywhere where you need to take something with you and you forgot it, all right? All right, so when I was in the Philippines, they told us, uh, whenever you go, you take a light bulb with you if it's at night, because if, you, if they left the light bulb in a public place, it'd be stolen and gone. So you take your light bulb with you, so if you've got to go into a restroom that's completely closed, and it's night, it's totally dark. Somebody's probably already taken the light bulb. So you take one with you, screw it in. Now you got light, you turn the light on. So the other thing you need to take is toilet paper. <laughs> we just assume everywhere we go that when you go into the restroom, there'll be a roll there, right? You just assume that. You assume that you just take that, what, what do you do? Oh my goodness, if you've not taken your toilet paper, because it's gone. Anybody leaves a roll of toilet paper, says, oh, well, pff, that's free. <laughs> and it's gone. Well, in the ancient world, you would just assume that when you take your, your lamp and you take your wick, that there would, be, there would be actually some oil there to put in there that you might be able to light it, that you might be able to light it. Now, obviously, if you'd used this before, this is still a little wet from the oil it had, so you might just want to tuck it in a good way so that it doesn't get everything else all wet because, because there's still some oil on it. Well, the foolish ones took their lamps but they did not take any oil with them. It's like going into the restroom without the light bulb or a roll of toilet paper. Okay. They went without it. The wise, however, they took oil in their jars with them. They also took a little jar, and it had probably seated pretty well, so they could also tuck it away. But do you run the risk that that little jar, okay, of oil might break and it might leak and all that? And it's a little cumbersome. It was a pain to have to carry that around. How'd you like to carry around a light bulb with you everywhere you go? <laughs> now, I kind of like the American convenience. Everybody provides those for you, right? And same for the tissue paper. Okay. So the wise, however, they took oil in their jars along with the lamps. And so they're wise. They're thinking ahead. The question becomes in the story, if Jesus is gone, all right, and he's returning with his bride, the church, and there's the ten wise, uh, there's the ten virgins, five wise and, and five that are foolish, what is the oil? Well, the oil is a figure through the scriptures of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. We have an anointing from the Holy Spirit. He's the Holy Spirit. He's the one who anoints. It's an anointing. The word anointing is to, to pour oil on the head and to anoint and consecrate to an office. The moment a person becomes a believer in Jesus Christ, they get the Holy Spirit. So behind the story, the story is this. Christ is in heaven. He's had a marriage. He's coming back for a reception. There's going to be a banquet and a great party. It's called the Millennial Kingdom. And he says, when he returns, the nation Israel, half of them are foolish and half of them are wise. Half of them have the Holy Spirit because they've received the Messiah. They've looked on him whom they have pierced and they've believed in their heart and they've received the Holy Spirit and they are the wise with the oil in their, their jars and in the lamp. Well, the bridegroom was a long time in coming. Of course, Jesus has been gone for like 2,000 years, and they became drowsy and fell asleep. So all of these, these, these virgins are sleeping, and all of a sudden at midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. So they're res responding, Messiah is coming. 
Then the virgins who woke up and they trimmed their lamps. Well, they could trim them and get them ready to go because there was still a little oil on the wick. And so they light their lamps. And the foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. Why? The little bit of oil that was left on the wick is all that's burning. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourself. Go get your own. <laughs> I'm not missing this party. No way. No way. But while they were on their way, can you imagine? Put yourself in their shoes. Oh, my goodness. I don't have any oil. So you jump on your donkey or your, your, your camel, and uh, you, know, uh, you, you head on down to the local Myers because you know it's open 24-7, <laughs> right? And you go in, oh, lo and behold, everybody else on planet Earth seems to be shopping at this time at night. The lines are long, and you're waiting so you could check out to get your olive oil. And so you get, finally you get your olive oil, you buy it, and it says here, the virgins who are ready went in with them to the wedding bank. Oh, the party's going on. They're already banqueting. They're eating, man. This is a fine dinner that they're having. They're having this party, this banquet. Okay, they're at the, they're at the wedding banquet. You know that the next thing is the dancing. Now, I don't know if they were doing that new thing uh, or the old thing. All right. I don't know if they were doing the, you know, what, the chicken, you know. I, I don't know what they were doing. But it says the door was shut. The party was underway. The banquet was going on. The reception. The band was playing. The music is all the food you want. He's talking about the kingdom. They're in the kingdom. They're with King Jesus, his bride, the church. They're in the kingdom. Later, the others who came, Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. Beating on that door. Now they got the, the fire that's lit. They found their way back. They're knocking on the door. Please let us in. Let us, let, let us in. But he replied, I tell you the truth. I don't know you. Whatever oil you have, it wasn't the oil of the Holy Spirit. You never received Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. You never bent your knee to Jesus. And now it is too late. Just like in the days of Noah, all the way up to the time he built the ark and he was preparing the ark, he was preaching. 120 years he's preaching, preaching, preaching. Repent. Because judgment is coming. He's preaching and preaching. Finally the door is shut and what? Now they want to get in. The door was shut. The door was shut. They could not get in. What's the point? Therefore, Jesus makes this point. Keep watch. Make sure you are a Christian. You have the Holy Spirit oil because you do not know the day or the hour. Some people say, well, I'll just wait till the last minute and accept Christ. That way I can live like the world and last minute I'll just accept Jesus like the thief on the cross and then I'll get to go to paradise, to heaven forever. And it's true if you can do that. But if you die too quickly, you're shut out. You're shut out. That's the whole point. Watch right now. Be prepared right now. Be prepared. You know, Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. He said, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher come from God. Nobody can do the miracles you do except God is with them. And Jesus, this young upstart preacher, this young rabbi, turns to this old season member of the Sanhedrin and he says to him, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God. Unless he is born of water, you've got to be physically born, and he's born of the Spirit, spiritually born. Flesh, and, and flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. You see, that's the way you make preparation. That's the way you're watchful. You receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. You're born again. You're born of the Spirit. And the Spirit invades your body because everyone who knows Jesus Christ as Savior, they get a down payment of the Holy Spirit. He takes up residency within our bodies so that we've seen before in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 6, and other places, Romans chapter 8, the Holy Spirit actually indwells us. We have the oil within the whole point is be prepared. Receive Jesus today while you may. The next parable that Jesus gives, he goes on and says, again, 
It will be like, what will be like? The kingdom of God, the coming kingdom, will be like a man going on a journey who calls his servants and entrusts his property to him. Now, let me just give you a heads up, the man going on the journey. The story behind the story that Jesus is telling is Jesus was telling his disciples, I am leaving, I'm going to heaven, and I'm on this long journey. And I'm going to, at some point, I'm going to bring my church out of the world, but then after that seven years of tribulation, after that's over, I'm going to return to the earth. I, he's gone on a long journey, and, and I've entrusted you with some things in life. In fact, what he goes on, he says, to the one he gave five talents of money. Five talents of money. To another he gave two talents of money. And to another one, one. Watch this. All according to his ability. I love that phrase. God never gives us more than we can handle. Never, ever. Not more blessing, not more difficulties. There is no problem in life that you have that God hasn't matched it to what you can handle. There is no blessing in life so great that you can't handle it. Maybe that's why God never blessed me with winning the lotto. <laughs> why? Maybe I can't handle it. You see what I'm saying? God gives. Everybody gets from God according to their ability. So guess what? I'm probably not going to be put on the carpet for not being able to sing very well. I have no rhythm. You have to have rhythm to sing, right? You got to have that. I may be put on the carpet for the talent that I have in art. Not everybody can draw. I learned that early. I used to say, what's wrong with you? Just draw a straight line. And that thing would go wave. Anybody like that? Got wavy lines? Anybody here try to draw a circle, make a nice round circle, and you say it looks more like an egg? Uh -huh. All right. Well, the same is true for every ability and talent. Some of you are good with numbers. Some of you are good with kids. Some of you, everybody's got their own ability. Here, he, in the story, he's talking about money. He gives one money on how they're able to manage and handle it. And that's a big tip-off in the whole story. Watch. The one who had received five talents, he went out and put his money to work, and he gained five more. I know of a church down in Ohio that what they did is they had an offering one week where they said, you take the money out. They put money in the offering. You take it out. You go invest it. And, and they did this at Thanksgiving time. And then you come back at Christmas, and, and you turn that money back in with what you've made off of it. Isn't that amazing? I'm not so daring. Uh, oh, have we? We might have to do that again. Anyway, the man had the five talents, went out, invested, put his money to use, and he brought back later more money. The second man, he got two talents, and he gained two more. The third man, he had received just one talent. Well, what Jesus said he gave according to the ability. And because he only had one, he knows he doesn't have really great, great abilities. He says he went off and he dug a hole in the ground and he hid his master's money. Why didn't he have great abilities? That in order to, he was afraid to invest. He was afraid to try to use this money to make more money. He had no entrepreneurial spirit within him. He was happy just not to lose it. He was just going to bury the money and hope that that would be enough. Every one of us sitting here has a talent. We have an amount of money. We have money. But we have other talents. We have time. We've all, all been given the same amount of time, but some of us learn to manage it better than others. Do you ever notice some people get a lot of things done and others don't get much done? Uh, we, have, we have talents. We have abilities. Um, singing, art, math. Some of you are good storytellers. Some have a way with kids. Some, I, and all these different talents. Some are writers. He took and he buried what God had given him. I call that like taking all of our talents and just sitting on the pew on Sunday. If you show up. And then the rest of the time, zero, zip, nothing. Well, this guy, he's buried it. After a long time. It hasn't happened yet, but the Lord is going to return. The master of those servants will return to settle accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five, and the master, he said, 
You have trust, entrusted me with the five talents, so see, I have gained five more. Boy, I've doubled your money. And his master replies, and here, here, here's this, well done. Oh, my goodness. Isn't that what we all want to hear from Jesus? Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Come into the kingdom. Share the the thousand-year rule and reign, and and you're going to have double possessions. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents, and see, I've gained two more. The economy must have been good. Kind of like ours today. Is our economy good? Well, for most Americans, they're feeling the economy is really good. He said, listen, I put money in the market, and man, it has just exploded. The money I put in now has doubled itself. And he said, I brought it out. Man, here, you've got twice as much you had before. His master says, well done, good and faithful servant. I love this. The billionaire who produced another billion is well done, good and faithful servant. The guy working on the second million because he gave up on the first. <laughs> All right? He's struggling to make it, but what he has, he put it in, he gets it. The same response, well done, good and faithful servant. You see, it's, it's, it's doing for God what you got. And, and both get the same reward. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been, you've been pay, faithful on a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come, share in your master's happiness. Join me in the kingdom. Then the man who had received the one talent, he came to the master and said, I knew you are a hard man. You're tough. You're, you're a tough negotiator. You harvest. You bring in where you haven't even sown. I don't know how you do it. You've got the mightest touch. Everything you do turches, turns to gold. You, you just got that touch. And you gather where you have not scattered seed. I don't know. It's just for some reason it's blessed. Uh, folks, that's the way it works for Jesus. Everything Jesus has and does is blessed. Jesus is God. So the man says, I was afraid, and I went out and I hid the talent in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. Whoa. Now we get a glimpse into his heart. He is lazy and he is wicked. He's wicked. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the banker so I could get, what, maybe a half a percent interest? You would have had something to show for your talent that I entrusted to you. And so that when I return, I would have received it back with at least the interest. Then take the talent from him and give it to another one who has the ten talents. Whoa, all of a sudden, the guy that had five and he doubled it, he now has ten. He says, take the guy that had the one and didn't do anything with it and give it back, give it now to the guy that has the ten. He's now got eleven. For everyone who has will be given more. And, and he will have an abundance And whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him and given to another. And then throw that, oh, now we know, he's worthless servant outside into darkness where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth or weeping and gnashing of teeth. And this one, because he's wicked, he doesn't do anything for the Lord because he's wicked in his heart receives his judgment and does not enter into the kingdom. What's what's here for us? What's the story here? If we're going to be faithful stewards as Christians, I'm going to have to invest my life and the resources God has given me in what really matters. 
I should be asking myself as I invest my money. Will this bring eternal reward or am I consuming it upon myself? When I use my time, will this bring eternal reward or am I wasting it on myself? When it comes to my abilities, some of you can sing. Am I using my voice for the Lord or am I wasting it on myself? You just go down to categories. Maybe some of you can draw. You have art. Maybe you've got skills. We, need, we always need help with, with our kids in, in our education. Maybe you got away with kids. Are you investing in what really matters? We come to the last of the three stories Jesus is talking about, about the kingdom. And it's about a shepherd dividing the flock. This time he doesn't say like or as or... It, it, it's still, he's telling us a story. He says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory. So he's still talking about just before and entering into the kingdom. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, all the angels will be with him. And he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. He's going to sit on the throne here on earth in heavenly glory. The glory that radiates in heaven is going to be here on earth when he sets up his kingdom here on the earth. All the nations will be gathered before him. All the nations. Now the word nations are all the Gentiles, all the people who are not Jewish. They're going to be gathered before him. And then it says in the story here, Jesus says, and he's going to separate one people from another. As a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, he's going to divide the sheep from the goats, and he's going to separate them. He will put the sheep on his right, and he will put the goats on his left. He's going to split all the peoples. And it's not like they're... America and Europe, or it's like every individual from among the Gentiles, they're going to be grouped into two groups. And then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. The king's going to say to them, come, you're going to go into the kingdom that has been prepared for you. You enter the kingdom. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the sheep are going to say, whoa. You see, the sheep are the Gentile peoples. And he's going to say to them, he says, then the righteous will answer. These are those who accepted Christ. And, and they're the sheep. And he's going to say, Lord, when did we feed you? When did we drink, give you drink? When did we invite you in? When did we clothe you? When did we go visit you? When did that happen? Because it, we, we didn't, you were in heaven. How did we do this to you? And the king will reply, King Jesus in his kingdom, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of these, the least of my brothers of mine, you did for me. You did for me. Wow. It does matter what we do to people. Jesus gave us the command to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. When asked, Who is your neighbor? He told them the story of the Good Samaritan. And the story of the Good Samaritan is who's ever in need that is in your vicinity, he's your neighbor. You reach out and you help them. And when you do so, you do it to the Lord. Now, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed. These are not the righteous. They have not accepted Christ. He says, into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For you gave me nothing to eat, nothing to drink. You did not invite me and you did not clothe me. You did not look after me. Then they will say, well, Lord, Lord, wait, wait. When did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? And then he's going to say, I tell you the truth, whenever you did not do it for one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. You did not do it for me. 
They will go away into eternal punishment. But the righteous to eternal life. There's going to be a separation at that time. What you do on the outside reflects who you are on the inside. What they did to the nation of Israel reflects what they were doing on the inside towards God, towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me summarize all this. Let's bring it all to a close. Three stories. Like the virgins, we need to be watchful, not foolish. We need to be prepared. We need the oil of the Holy Spirit. We need to receive Jesus. We need to be born again, born of the Spirit. We need the flame, the fire in our lives. Like the stewards, we need to be faithful. Whatever it is that God has given us, we need to be faithful. With our money, our finances, our time, uh, our energies, our, our, our abilities, we just need to be faithful unto the Lord. Like the sheep, we need to be thoughtful. They were thoughtful. When they reached out to those who were in need, that's why we have a ministry like uh, partnering with the open door, that we can reach out to those who are in need. That's why we're going to assemble packages. And that's why we need your help this, this Saturday. There's going to be over 200 people coming here to receive food for Thanksgiving. We need to be thoughtful. We need to reach out. For when Jesus comes again, he will reward us according to what we did with our talents and with respect to the Lord and his people. He is going to... Re so, so the question, so what are, we, what are we doing with our talents? What are we doing for the least of these, his brothers? Am I living watchful and prepared, faithful and thoughtful? Let's pray. Father in heaven... These verses challenge us to know you and not just about you, to have a relationship with you. They challenge us, Lord, to be faithful every day, asking ourselves the question, what would Jesus do so that we might be like him? And then, Lord, they challenge us to be thoughtful, not just thinking of ourselves, but thinking of those around us, those who are in need, how I can be the hands and the feet of Jesus, reaching out and touching them, using what I have to help those who are in need. For to do it unto the least of them is to do it unto you. Lord, we anticipate the day we enter into the kingdom. What a day of glory that will be. But we know it all starts with being born again and knowing Jesus Christ is our Savior. Work in our hearts, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.